Hello everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Jack Edwards and so far this year, in 2023, I have read 47 books, which I fully appreciate is unhinged behaviour. That is not new information to me, I know that's absurd, but I wanted to talk about those books today. I've been doing the dirty work, so you don't have to, and so I basically thought that I would rank these books from worst to best. So you know what is top of the pile and what is so low that we realise that rock bottom actually has a bunker. There is a level lower than that. And what a perfect segue <laughs> to the first book. Screaming, crying, throwing up, punch me in the face. This is the worst book I've read so far this year, but emphasis on so far, because there's still nine months for this to be usurped. That's long enough to have a baby. Like, we, there is time, so don't worry about it. But this book is called Fake Accounts, and it follows a woman who realizes that her boyfriend has been running a secret conspiracy theory account. He is not who she thought he was, and that is a really interesting concept. So tell me why we kill him off in the first 20 pages, and then for the next 250 pages, she moves from the US to Berlin, and is just walking around being insufferable. She said annoying world tour. It's kind of a study on dating, but nothing really happens. Like, what happened to the original plot of the movie? And then right at the end, it turns out that he actually faked his own death. He didn't really die. And I felt like that was meant to be shocking, but I thought, honestly, I think I would fake my own death too to get away from this woman. Next, in at number 46, we have Insatiable. This is an ironic title because I had had enough, almost immediately. It's basically a book about this woman who hates her job and then she meets a couple who invite her to some anatomy-defying orgies. I was reading this book, like, I actually don't know if it is physically, humanly possible to do some of these positions that this woman does. It's genuinely impressive. But to be totally honest with you, if I wanted to read about a bunch of privileged snobs fucking something, I would just read the UK government's policy making. That would be enough for me, that would do the job. Fiona and Jane is marketed as a story about these two best friends. So I was confused when they barely interacted and there doesn't seem to be a massive foundation for their friendship in the first place. Like I wasn't really rooting for them as friends. They kind of operate separately and all of the interesting things that are featured in the book are just mentioned in passing and they aren't expanded on at all. If you need me, I will be in town putting up missing posters for the plot of this book. Next, we have The Novelist. Now, I don't think I've ever described a book as being full of shit before, but this book mostly takes place on the toilet. It's about a man who is trying to write a novel but keeps getting distracted, but it talks about this in vivid detail, like detail no one needed or asked for. Like why am I reading about this man getting toilet paper stuck in his bum hair? This book is written for a very specific type of person who will find it funny and quirky, but that person wasn't me. In at 43, we have I Kissed Shara Wheeler. Now, Casey McQuiston is sort of building up this queer utopia with her fiction. They're generally very fun and feel good, but for me, this one was just a little bit silly. And the stakes in this book were so low, they're medium rare. A young girl stages her own disappearance and leaves clues for a few people that she has kissed. The police, by the way, not bothered, not interested, never mentioned in this book, even though a young girl has literally disappeared, and instead this girl from her class who has kissed Shara Wheeler goes on the hunt for her, and I just frankly didn't care. <laughs> and, and that's it, really. On the Road by Jack Kerouac is a book I was so buzzing to read. I've looked forward to reading this for years, and <laughs> honestly it was kind of underwhelming. I can respect this book for being so innovative, at the time, because road trip novels had never really been done before when this was published. But in the big year of 2023, I just found this a little bit dull. I wanted to be a lover of this book. I thought for years that I would be, but I finally got around to reading it, and honestly, my hateritis is flaring up. I I'm a hater of this book. No, hate is a strong word. I didn't hate it, but I feel like I was underwhelmed by this book. There are some beautiful lines, but they're few and far between. I felt like I had been on the road for years. Marigold and Rose is a short story about these twins and the first year of their life and how they have these completely opposite personalities. And I just get this overwhelming feeling that this is the kind of book that was only really published because the author was already successful. And I felt like that's all I want to say about this. Salt Slow, I loved Julia Armfield's other book. 
And that's all I'm gonna say. Next, I Who Have Never Known Men. Now, when I reviewed this on Goodreads and the Story Graph, I got a lot of comments, because a lot of people really like this book, but I wanna explain what I, what I think missed the mark a little bit. For me, the exposition in this book is so clunky and awkward. It's about a group of 40 women who have been in this underground bunker, and the main POV is the youngest of those 40 women who does not remember anything outside of this bunker. She has been there for 12 years, and yet those whole 12 years are just completely ignored. It's like the author treats it as if she's just suddenly spawned, because we're given all the context of the plot through these really weird questions where our main POV is asking the other women in the bunker questions that if you had been in that bunker for 12 years, you would obviously know the answer to. There are so many plot holes and inconsistencies and like two convenient moments, which honestly to me just felt lazy. I don't understand why our main character didn't just introduce us to life in the bunker as someone who knows. Instead, it's like she's learning everything from scratch, but she's been there for 12 years. The book really focuses on logistical details, like over and over and over, instead of unpacking how the character viewed the world. I also felt like the concept of never knowing men wasn't really explored that much. So I feel like the concept that the title promised was a bit of a catfish. I was just disappointed by this because it felt like it had incredible potential. Next, we have Queer by William S. Burroughs. This is a rambling kind of exploration of lust and repression and isolation. It's about this man who goes from bar to bar and meets very sleazy people and expresses these masochistic sexual desires. This one gets a bombastic side eye from me. Speaking of which, Lapvona, another book that is quite literally full of shit. I saw someone say that the peach scene in Call Me By Your Name walked so the grape scene in this book could run. And let's just leave it at that. I felt this one was just shocking and depraved kind of for the sake of it. And so the plot and the characters just become increasingly absurd and ridiculous. I like Otesha's other work, but this one wasn't really my thing. Mouth to Mouth plunged me into a reading slump. It's about a man who saves another man from drowning. He then stalks that man, becomes employed by that man, dates that man's daughter, and goes on a ski trip with that man. And throughout all of this very rational behavior, <laughs> he realizes that that man is actually kind of a terrible bloke. And so he starts to sort of question whether he should have actually saved that man's life, whether that was a good thing to have done, and takes about 250 pages to do so. Spare is Prince Harry's autobiography. If you didn't know that, are you Patrick Starr? Have you been living under a literal rock? Because this is one of those rare occasions where the same thing that is trending on TikTok is also trending on like the Daily Mail. What I appreciated about this book is that he really didn't hold back, penis frostbite included. And you know what? Maybe he should have held back <laughs> at some point, but his publishing house got their money's worth, right? He really did share everything, no detail is spared. If you buy this book, you definitely get your money's worth of tea, if that's what you came here for. They didn't really edit anything out, and I think that's probably because it's so rare that someone gives such an insight into the palace and the royal family, and so I think the publishing house were just like, include everything this man has said. I think maybe it did need <laughs> a little bit more editing, because this book was long. I mean, the crown could have covered this in two episodes max. Personally, I'm not really that interested or invested in the royal family, but I mostly read this book because I had FOMO. And I will never view Elizabeth Arden Cream in the same way ever again. If you know, you know. You know too much, in fact. Then we have Mr. Salary, which is a short story by Sally Rooney, and this is definitely like the blueprint for her longer novels. It feels like an early draft. It feels like she's practicing, like flexing her muscles a little bit. You know what, to me, it kind of feels like if you fed an AI every single Sally Rooney novel and said, make me a short story using this information, this is what it would spit out. And you know I love her. You know I am the chair of governors of the Sally Rooney Defense League, but this to me was like unremarkable. I, like her novels are just infinitely better than this. Watching women and girls is also kind of like unremarkable, a little bit forgettable. It's a very okay 
selection of stories. It's very aggressively average about a range of women, how they view themselves, how they view each other, and how others view them. Before we continue, I just wanted to let you know that today's video is very, very kindly brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the go-to all-in-one platform if you want to build a website or an online brand. Absolutely no coding experience is required to do that because Squarespace has this amazing array of templates which are really easy to customize and use as the perfect starting point. I am very grateful for this because I would not even know where to start when building a website, but Squarespace does all the hard work for you so you can just make your dreams a reality and bring your vision to life and make something that is completely unique to you. So you can customize it, there's great analytical features so you can see what people are enjoying, what content you should continue making more of, and there's also a blogging feature where you can share what you're up to behind the scenes with your audience as well. So if you have been putting off building your website because you were like, that is too complicated, how will I do that? Look no further, Squarespace has got you covered. You can head to squarespace.com right now for a free trial and then you can use the code Jack Edwards at squarespace.com slash Jack Edwards when you are ready to launch your website and you can get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. You're welcome. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Then we have reminders of him. Now look, say what you like about Colleen Hoover being basic, having a very straightforward writing style, but the woman can tell a story. And I hate the kind of snobbery that I see surrounding that. However, what I will say is I feel like Colleen Hoover's worst habit is that she will use things as plot devices and then not really think about them in enough depth. For example, in this book, we have a woman who has been sent to prison and then has recently been released from that prison. And we just never really get any reflection or thoughtful consideration of the criminal justice system or what it's like to be rehabilitated, what it's like to become reaccustomed to the world. I feel like Colleen Hoover is very much no critical thinking, just vibes. But I do acknowledge that sometimes that is what people want, so take it or leave it, I guess. Cultish is a study on the language of fanaticism. Firstly, it's about how cults employ certain language to sort of lure people in, but then the book expands on this and talks about how companies and industries do the same thing, and they employ the language of cults to get people to subscribe to their service and to forge communities. And this can be in a positive sense, like things like Alcoholics Anonymous, but it can also be used in negative ways like MLMs and pyramid schemes. And then she also talks about how it's used in advertising of things like athleisure brands, of gyms, of makeup brands, where they say like, join the revolution, join the cult, the cult beauty. It is interesting, it's educational, I did learn some things, but I just wish that it had focused more on language specifically, or it spent more time unpacking specific uses of language and the rhetorics that cults use. There's a lot of case studies in this book, but they take up too much of the book, I think, because really the close attention to language was the most interesting part. So I just wish there was more of that. Pachinko, I was so frustrated with because the first third of this book was so Brilliant, like genuinely, I thought this was gonna be an easy five star. I thought this was on its way to becoming a new favorite book. However, the next third is kind of like a little bit mid. And then the final third is genuinely a bit bad. In that final section, ideas and concepts and characters are just picked up and dropped. I don't know what happened to the intricacy and the meticulous attention to detail in this final section, but I kept thinking maybe the author should have split this into multiple books so that she could really consider this final part because it just felt rushed and weird. Pachinko ultimately follows this one family through the generations, but it starts off strong and then completely drops off and it was heartbreaking to watch that happening in a book. I'm still so gutted about that. I don't know what happened there. Bliss montage. Now, funny story about this book is that I was reading this when the Be Real notification came up. And I think I posted a picture of like the next page I was about to read and then immediately got distracted by my phone. So I put the book down and never read the page that I had posted on my Be Real. And then I was getting loads of messages from people being like, what? Did you just upload? And it turns out the next story that I had not yet got onto was called Yeti Lovemaking. And it is quite literally about someone having sex with a Yeti. And I had put that on my B-reel with like no context. And honestly, I think that sums up the vibe of this book perfectly. In losing the plot, a man imagines what his mother's journey from Ghana to the UK would have been like. And he documents her life with little notes in the margins, commenting on his experience as her son. And this book is fragmented and abstract, but it's also a fascinating 
insight and a beautiful portrait of his mum. The Last White Man ponders on what it would be like if white people started waking up black. It's an interesting, kind of thought-provoking concept, and I feel like it's almost done well. Like, it so nearly reaches its potential, but just slightly misses. I liked the poetic writing style, but I felt like it sort of just scratched the surface on the idea, the concept that it brought up. It was almost like the concept was too big for the book, and so I just don't think the book is as memorable or profound as it could have been and as it kind of set itself up to be. Then we have Exteriors, and this is a kind of study on humanity. Annie Erno essentially writes a series of observations based on things she has overheard or seen and witnessed in public places, like the supermarket, on the train, and so she's thinking about what we can learn from the exterior life happening all around us. And it's just an interesting kind of microcosm of society. I love books that focus on the little intimacies of human behaviour, so I liked this. And so now we're kind of in the realm of books that I mostly had positive feelings towards. Yoke is set in New York City and follows these two sisters, Jane and June, one of whom gets diagnosed with cancer. And it's a study on sibling relationships and dating and mental health and eating disorders and a family dynamic. I think I kind of felt like there were a lot of random unnecessary scenes which didn't necessarily add to the plot, but it was an easy read and in equal parts funny and then the heart crushingly sad. Not excellent, but worth a crack. The egg puns. You know there were going to be egg puns if the book is called Yoke, right? Okay, this is officially the halfway point and we have Haruko love poems. Honestly, these are just really sweet and sensitive love poems. They have me in my feels. I'll definitely be returning back to this collection. I liked it. Another poetry collection, Beasts at Every Threshold. This contains so many gorgeous and tender poems. My personal highlight was In My Next Life as a Fruit Tree. That poem is beautiful, but I'm not sure that the experimentation of this book worked 100% of the time. Overall though, I enjoyed this poetic exploration of otherness. I just felt like you can kind of see her construction lines sometimes where what she tried out didn't necessarily work. People Change is a kind of manifesto on reinvention and sexuality and fluidity and gender performance. And it's about being malleable and changing over time. And I thought it was super thoughtful and empowering and using lots of cultural moments as reference points. So it's fun. The Red Notebook is perfect for getting yourself out of a reading slump because it's this quick, page-turning story about a man who finds a handbag and, kind of based on its contents, falls in love with the owner. And while that's all happening, we as the readers know that the actual owner of that handbag is in a coma. When she wakes up, he wants to meet her, but he doesn't really know how to address the fact that he has rummaged through her handbag and has discovered quite a lot about her. And so I thought this book was so readable, so bingeable, and just a wholesome read, set in Paris, it'll make you want to go there, it's... Yeah, I thought it was good. When you are engulfed in flames. Now, David Sedaris writes these really genuinely funny stories and anecdotes about his life, and they read like a stand-up comedy routine. I love his style of storytelling. This was super feel-good, and a welcome bit of comic relief from my usual very depressing reads. Don't worry, <laughs> they're coming. Things We Lost in the Fire is a short story collection of Argentinian horror by Mariana Enriquez. I really liked her previous book, The Dangers of Smoking in Bed, and honestly, I liked that book more than this one. Both are good, but if I were to recommend just one, it would be the one before. The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. I finally read it. This was great escapism, an awesome concept. It's about a girl who makes a Faustian deal with the devil to live forever, but the stipulation is that she will be forgotten by everyone she meets. And this creates some curious little scenarios, and we explore almost all of them. <laughs> we explore a lot of different scenarios that she gets herself into, until she meets someone who can remember her. Now, there are flaws with this book. Firstly, the character actually is kind of forgettable because she's given no other real character traits aside from the fact that people forget her. And then the other thing is that this book is incredibly and painfully Eurocentric and American-centric. This woman has lived for centuries and seems to never once encounter a single person of colour. All of the cultural references are about Europe or America. Similar to Pachinko, I wish this had been a series of books because the concept is great and I feel like it would have been interesting to see Adi LaRue travel across 
different parts of the world that just felt like a limitation on a really cool idea. And yeah, I just wish there was a little bit more character building outside of her immediate predicament. The world keeps ending and the world goes on. Firstly, what a stunning title for a poetry collection. It's by a Korean American poet. Actually, did I mention that I'm in Korea right now? I'm so excited. There's gonna be some really cool content coming to my channel very soon. This trip is good for my soul. It's if you'll, if you'll pardon the pun. Anyway, this has some brilliant moments and some great lines. It's a little bit nihilistic, there's a bit of eco-criticism, and it's also about the diaspora, like lots of big ideas distilled expertly into these poems. A horse at night on writing. Now, if you're an aspiring author, this is a great read. It's a collection of essays by Amina Cain, who wrote in Delicacy, which is also a great read, with insights into her own inspirations and reasons and methodology for writing. This honestly just made me really inspired to keep working on my novel, and for that, I am grateful. Detransition Baby is such a thought-provoking book. It's about a trans couple, one of whom detransitions, and then we follow these two characters through their lives as they confront a range of issues which also regularly confront trans people. And so a range of ideas and discussions surrounding trans rights are brought up and discussed conversationally with a range of characters, and I thought this was such an interesting arena for that conversation. It asks difficult questions, but in a tender and respectful and empathetic, compassionate way. It's nuanced, it requires a lot of thinking, for sure, but it's beautifully written, so well done, and I think this is gonna be a landmark in trans literature. So I'm grateful to have read it. Oxygen Mask is a graphic novel about the cursed year of 2020. It references the pandemic and social distancing and the murder of George Floyd. The writing is devastating, the art is exquisite, and just so raw, this honestly blew me away. Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine, and you know what, she's the only one, because after reading this, I was not fine, I was not fine at all, but in the best way possible. This is essentially a study on loneliness and the concept of being alone, and how those two things are not always the same thing. We slowly uncover details of Eleanor's traumatic childhood. I thought it was really sweet and endearing, but also poignant and acknowledges PTSD in a really interesting way, and also in a very delicate way, which I think is important. Argonauts is Maggie Nelson's stunning memoir about a queer relationship and making a family within that relationship. It considers identity and desire and love and language. And this is big brain energy. If you think you've been to Tenerife, Maggie Nelson has been to Elevenerife, Fourteenerife. She's thought about it all and put it into beautiful, exquisite writing. The book does reference a lot of incredibly complex theory, but in a very accessible way. It's kind of a tour through criticism, and I think I learned a lot. I was actually recommended this book for a video that I did on ChatGPT, so if you want to go check out that video, this was genuinely a great recommendation. I'm actually scared that AI knew I would like this. Hex is about witchcraft. I was hooked. This book follows a woman who has been sentenced to death in the Scottish gallows in like the 16th century, and she is accused of witchcraft. And she is being visited by a modern day witch who's kind of time traveling, I guess. And it's a really interesting feminist tale. It's short, but super touching. Lessons in chemistry. Oh, this book was like cracked me, I swear. The pages were laced with something because I could not put this down. And this is not just lessons in chemistry, it is a lesson in storytelling. It's so well written. It's about a woman in STEM in like the 50s slash 60s who ends up getting a job as a TV chef. And she treats her mostly female audience with respect. She doesn't talk to them condescendingly, like a lot of advertisements at the time did. And it's another great story with a really strong feminist message. And there is also a kind of love story-ish, but it's not a romance. Some characters sometimes are a little bit one-dimensional and kind of like a bit of a caricature of themselves, but overall, I love this. Anna Green Gables is a classic that just totally lived up to the expectation. Like, this book is highly rated, but not overrated. It's it's perfectly rated, it deserves to be highly rated. I thought it was great, and it just makes you really appreciate the joys of everyday life and the outside world. So wholesome and heartwarming, I just wish I'd read it sooner, to be honest. If We Were Villains. It's about a group of thespians who put on Shakespeare plays, but these plays are so 
immersive, like it's told from the actor's perspective. So you genuinely feel like you're in the play. It kind of blurs the lines of what is happening in real life and what's happening in the play. And it is a dark academia book with a kind of murder mystery. In fact, our central protagonist is being released from prison at the start of the book and is essentially telling the truth for the first time. There's twists, there's turns. Like I said, my favorite scenes were the plays. I feel like this just really captured why so many of us love Shakespeare. The death of Ivan Ilyich considers death and disease and mortality and confronting that and the inevitability of dying from someone who has previously lived a very frivolous, chaotic, self-absorbed and self-benefiting life. Here's so many brilliant lines that made me want to sob a little bit or a lot of it. This just really stopped me in my tracks and it's a great classic. It's a great taste of Tolstoy if you're not yet ready for War and Peace. Although I never really thought I would read War and Peace until I read this book and now I'm like, maybe I wanna read War and Peace after all. <laughs> because this was really good. I don't know why I said that, like that girl from Camp Rock, but she's like, she's really good. Serious concerns. I am seriously concerned for anyone who hasn't experienced the joys of Wendy Cope's poetry. They're so great, they really make you appreciate the small pleasures and the ordinary wonders of the life around you and just being grateful to exist. Your Honor, I love her. My top five books that I've read so far in 2023 opens with Hearts and Bones. This is my favorite short story collection of the year so far. It's about love in all its various forms. I think it's like straightforward writing, but it really packs a punch. And I read this whole thing in one sitting because I just <laughs> couldn't put it down. And some of these stories gave me shivers. My personal favorites were The Doll and Mother's Day. And I don't know, whenever I have a really visceral, physical reaction to a book, like just words on a page, I'm always so impressed. And this book, absolutely did that to me. Alone With You in the Ether is one of the most beautifully written romance books I have ever encountered. So poetic, full of sublime, carefully crafted and well-considered metaphors and analogies. This is a book that just makes you want to fall in love. It's so special. It's about these two fully fleshed out characters who collide. They have their own traumas and issues going on. I felt like they were perfectly developed and when they come together it is magical and then destructive and read this book it's so good small things like these is quietly devastating it's about this little town in ireland around christmas time it is so cozy but at the same time has a hugely important message to share because it's about a man who ultimately commits a very selfless act and it draws attention to a problematic part of Irish history. So there were basically these institutions for fallen women, which were upheld and supported by the oppressive church. So for me, this was an education, but also after finishing it, I was like, I immediately now need to read anything else Claire Keegan has published. And spoiler alert, we're into the top two now, and one of those books is another Claire Keegan book, and it's not number two. My second favorite book that I've read so far this year was In the Dream House. It is an absolutely heartbreaking and soul-bearing memoir about abuse in a queer relationship and how this impacted the author. And the writing is just captivating and lyrical and poetic. So sincere, so honest, so vulnerable. I dream of being able to write like this. And then finally, in at number one, we have Foster by Claire Keegan. This is actually kind of similar to Out of Green Gables. I think it kind of follows that literary tradition. It's about a girl who goes to live with a foster family because her mom just keeps popping out babies and <laughs> she's got like a ninth baby on the way. And so the girl that we follow is sent off to a foster home just to be looked after while her mom is going through labor. And in this summer that she spends with this family, she really gets to know them. We watch them bond during mundane little acts like going shopping, going to the beach, it's really tender, but also silence is a really important motif in this book. Like the things that aren't being said. This is one of my favorite things in a book where the ending is kind of 
ambiguous, like you're sort of left to decide what you think the final words mean. And I really liked that. This book is small but mighty. It's just so good. Again, I had shivers reading this. And so, it has been a mixed bag so far this year, but that's the joy, that's why we keep reading. And of course, there are plenty more reviews to come. So thank you so, so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. I hope you have a wonderful day and I will catch you very, very soon. All the best, stay in touch, Bye bye